Say, hello, my name is... Hello, my name is Harold A. Nelson. Where and when were you born? I was born at Wallback, Nebraska, on a farm in 19... February the 28th, in 1915. So how old are you right now? I'm 103. Do you feel like you're 103? Uh, probably not, <laughs> because I don't know what 103 should feel like. How old do you feel? Oh, I feel about 85. <laughs> Physically, what is it like to be 103? Oh, it's, it's kind of difficult to get around, but everything is working all right. If I could just hear, I'd be 100%. Do you have any pain at all? Any pains? Oh, I got lots of pains in every joint. That's my biggest problem. What branch of the service were you in? The, the U.S. Army. What division, regiment, and company were you in? I was in F Company of the 7th Infantry of the 3rd Division. And what was your specific role in Company F? Well, that depends on what time I was in. I ended up as Staff Sergeant Platoon Leader. And where did you see combat? Well, I saw combat in Africa, Sicily, and Italy. And what was the highest rank you achieved by the time you left the service? Staff Sergeant. Were you ever wounded? I was wounded twice. And what was the highest decoration you received for valor? The Bronze Star. I was put in for the Silver Star, but they lost my record. So I want to go back a little bit. You Are you recording? Oh. Is that okay? Yes. <laughs> you said you were born in Nebraska. Yes. Did you grow up in Nebraska? Yes, I did. Wallback, Nebraska. Where is that? It's north of the Grand Island, Nebraska. It's the center part of Nebraska on a farm. Talk to me about what it was like growing up in Wallback, Nebraska. Well, I... It, we lived three miles from school. We walked three miles every day for 12 years. Then, so that's six miles a day every day for 12 years. What kind of things did you do for fun when you were growing up? Well, we did, played a little bit of baseball. We didn't have many things to do to, for entertainment where I lived. Did you have any brothers or sisters? I had uh, one brother and three sisters. What do you remember about the Great Depression? Oh, we, we didn't have anything uh, but lived on what we had. Tell me about the struggles that your family faced. Well, I don't know. We just worked our day and night, seven days a week. That was about it. Didn't get to do much else. How big was Wallback, Nebraska? Yeah, probably was five, six hundred. So everyone knew everyone? Well, mostly, yes. When you and your buddies would get together when you were a kid, what would you guys do? We we played base or baseball or go hunting. What kind of mischief would you get into? I didn't get into any mischief because if I did, my dad would give me the dickens. <laughs> what 
did you want to do with your life before the war broke out? What were you planning on doing? I guess I was still going to be a farmer because I knew nothing else. I did take a course in radio and television by correspondence, which, which helped me in later life, but I never did pursue it. What high school did you go to? What, what high school? The wall back. And what year did you graduate? What year? Uh, not, uh, 1915. Wait a minute, that's my birthday. <laughs> 1933, I think. <laughs> You're testing my memory now. What were you doing before the war broke out? After you graduated high school, what did you do? I just formed with my folks. That's it. And then, then uh, my dad run a filling station in Hist Hastings, Nebraska. And that's where I got drafted in the service. I, I was one of the first ones to be drafted in Hastings, Nebraska. How old were you when you were drafted? I, I was 26 when I got drafted. Wow, so you were pretty old already. Well, I guess so. I wanted to join the Air Force, and I was a year too old. They only wanted to take people 25. Were you married before the war? No. I had a lady friend, though, and I married her after I got back from the war. What kind of things did people do for dates back then, when you guys were growing up? Oh, we, we went to dances, that's about it. it was the only, and I went fishing a little bit. But dances was pretty popular? Dancing was about the only entertainment we had in my country. But when you were growing up in Wallback, yeah. where was the closest big city for you guys to go to? What was the closest what? City. Grand Island. Grand Island, Nebraska. And how far was that from Wallback? 40 miles. 40 miles? Yes. Did you guys have a car? Well, my dad had a 1923 Model T. That's what I learned to drive on. You pushed it uphill with your left foot, and you backed up with your uh, left foot. <laughs> so, when you were growing up, were you aware of what was going on? in Europe with Hitler, or what the Japanese were doing in China? No, I had no idea. We didn't have very much communication. The lady who you eventually married, was she from Wahlbeck? No, she was from south of Spalding, Nebraska. How did you guys meet? Oh. How did you meet? Well, we met at, I met her at a dance. That's about the only place to meet people. <laughs> so. Did you have any experiences with the Dust Bowl? I sure did. We couldn't, didn't even have daylight. Tell me your experiences with the Dust Bowl. What was the Dust Bowl? The Dust Bowl, the wind blew and the wind blew from Oklahoma. We got Oklahoma dirt in our farm, Oklahoma and Kansas. You couldn't, some days you couldn't see the sun. And tell me about the work that you did on the farm. What kind of farm was it? Well, we raised corn and uh, oats. We had done everything with horses, hand, Walk, 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 everything, walking plow, walking harrow, everything was walking with horses. And did you have any other jobs growing up? 
besides working on the farm? No, I didn't. Had all I could do on the farm. How many acres you guys have? How many acres? 160 plus 360 we rented later on the year. So how close was your closest neighbor? Uh, one, about a mile. So what would you guys do if you had an emergency? I have no idea what we'd do. <laughs> so you were drafted before Pearl Harbor, right? Yes, I was. I spent, I, I was in uh, Fort Lewis, Washington when they bombed Pearl Harbor. Tell me about that. What do you remember? How did you hear about it? What were you doing? Well, we were in the in the barracks in the Fort Lewis, Washington, and they announced that they bombed Pearl Harbor, that we had to get out, get our clothes on, get our ammunition and and, and one blanket, and head for the hills. So we did that in about three hours, and it was cold. So we stayed in the in the timber, uh, west east of uh, Seattle, Tacoma, for about three days. Because they thought there was a, a Jap Japanese submarine out going to shell us off the coast. So then we got to come back into the barracks when they didn't find any. So explain to me, when you were drafted, where did they send you? When I was drafted, they sent me to uh, Fort, uh, uh, Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. For basic training? That's where I was uh, inducted into the Army. Fort, for, I think it was Fort Lewis. Or Fort Leavenworth. Fort Leavenworth, yes. Where did you get your basic training? In Camp Roberts, California. Uh, I've been to Camp Roberts. That's a godforsaken place for in the summertime. <laughs> it was so hot and no, no shade. So, but we made it okay, I guess. Take me through a typical day of basic training. Did I say that again? Take me through a typical day of basic training. Well, we had to get up and have reveille, which we'd get out in the outside and stand with and have a physical exercise. And then we'd have uh, our breakfast and and go out in the in the area and do some army training. Rifle practice, mostly rifle practice. So, and I, of course we had our regular uh, evening dinner. T tell me about the marching that you had to do. Oh, once in a while we had a march out in the hills and back and march in the training area. Try to keep in step and I didn't do very good <laughs> when I was trying to march in step. Were most of the people around your age, or were most of them younger than you? Most of them were younger than me. I was probably the oldest one. I don't remember. So after basic training, where did you go? I went to Fort Lewis, Washington. And what happened when you were at Fort Lewis? We had to do amphibious training, regular army training, where we practiced rifle shooting and, and, and boat landings. Did you expect a war to happen before Pearl Harbor? Did you expect that something was going to happen? No, I had no idea. I was just a dumb Nebraska farmer. But why would they draft you? Didn't you think that there must be something happening? No, I don't know why they drafted me. I guess they thought I was a good walking soldier. <laughs> okay, so tell me. 
Where were you when you heard about the attack on Pearl Harbor? I was in my bunk in bed at Fort Lewis, Washington. And how did you hear about it? Over the loudspeaker. What did they say? Oh, I, I have no idea what they said. So they, well, they just made us get up and get our clothes on and head for the hills. They thought the Japanese submarine was going to shell Fort Lewis. So we had to get the heck out of there. What was that like for you to hear that your country had been attacked? Oh, I don't know. It was, didn't soak in, I guess, what really happened. And explain to me, after the attack on Pearl Harbor, what happened to you? You know, there, there was a difference. You know, now the U.S. was in a war. So talk to me about the, tell me about the change in training. Well, we really had to train hard, and we had to train for uh, amphibious landings. So that was after Pearl Harbor? Yes. And then what? where did you go from there? We went to San Diego, California. And then where? <laughs> and then up to Camp, uh, and then up to Monterey, California. Well, from Monterey, after doing amphibious training there, we went to Camp Pickett, Virginia. And then? And that, that's where we did some more amphibious training. And from there, and from there, we we got on a troop ship to to go to war. Well, we left some place in New Jersey. And then we made an invasion in Africa at Fidela in West Africa. What do you remember about the invasion of North Africa? Well, North Africa, we were about 10 miles out in the ocean in the ship, and we had to disembark on rope ladders down in the Higgins boats. Uh, which was a disaster because we, the the uh, waves were about ten foot high. And the boat would go up and down, and the uh, going down that rope ladder, it, the the boat would break some of our legs. But I got down there okay. And then we we took the Higgins boat to invasion by Fidela in. Uh, in Africa, West Africa. Well, the landing was very disastrous because we didn't land on a sandy beach. We landed on a coral rock be beach, which is a terrible thing to land on because it busted the bottom of the boats and we had to wade out through the water and through those uh, rocks. and. Half of my, half of my partner, all the landing boats got wrecked on the beach. Well, we didn't have any enemy fire right away, but then when we got close to Fidela, we got got shelled and uh, uh, not a lot of rifle fires, mostly from shells from uh, German uh, uh, battleships, the USS Zealand and that and the, uh, not. Rich, German Richlieu was shelling us on shore. How close did the shells get to you? How close? Well, within a spitting distance. <laughs> I dug a, I dug a hole behind the grave, grave marker. And I, I don't know whether the guy knew I, he saved my life or not. <laughs> what was it like having these? naval shells going off around you. Well, it scared the dickens out of you, I know that. Where did you guys land? Was it in Iran or Algeria? It was in Iran at, at Fidela in, in Africa. And what was the terrain like? What did it look like? Oh, just a kind of uh, open country. The shore was rocky where we landed. We weren't supposed to land on those raw coral reefs. 
how long did it take to get from the United States to North Africa? Oh, I think something like a week, almost a week, because they had to get a lot of troop ships together before they landed, before they started sailing. How did you pass the time on the ship? Uh, heaving overboard. And you got seasick? And we had some calisthenics training. And that's about it. <laughs> okay. So, um, do you remember, was there an American naval bombardment before you guys went in? The American ships. It was a ship. No, the American ships. Did they shell Africa before you guys went in? No, they, as far as I know, they didn't shell Africa. So you guys went in little Higgins boats? In the Higgins boats, yes. What were you thinking on your way? I don't know what the heck I was thinking. I was thinking about the living, I guess. <laughs> so when you were in the Higgins boat and you were on your way to North Africa. Yeah, yeah. You know. Hig the Higgins boats were just rough water and there's rough landing. But uh, I made it all right, but a lot of my men didn't. They were drowned. And, 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 and injured in the rocks and then getting off into the Higgins boat. The Higgins boat took us to the shore, but we, they couldn't get a very good landing where we landed on those rocks. Did, did the Higgins boat drop you off in the water? Yeah, yeah, it dropped, I got, got wet climbing over those rocks. One time you'd be down in water t six foot deep, and next time you'd be on top of a rock. We just jumped overboard into the water because the boats couldn't land on those uh, coral reefs. So you got stuck away from the shore. Well, yeah, we, we, they couldn't go in. We weren't on a regular beach. We were on coral rocks where, I, where we landed. We were supposed to land on a sandy beach. But we didn't. Where did you land then? North of Fidela, Africa. And so you guys, the boat hit coral reefs, and the rock, it couldn't go any further. No, it couldn't go any further, so we just jumped into the water and uh, tried to wade ashore. There was a lot of casualties in the landing, but no rifle fire against us. So what were the casualties from? From drowning or getting legs broke in the rocks. Could you see where you were going or was it too dark? No, it was still daylight, it was daylight. But we had no idea where we were going. How heavy was your pack? Well, it was too dang heavy, but I don't know how much. <laughs> but, but you finally get to the land. Yes. And then what? Well, then we kind of regrouped halfway and, and started heading towards Fidela. Uh, what was the importance of Fidela? I don't know. It's just where the uh, enemy was. And as far as I know, we just had to go there. Was that a city? or? Was it was it a city, yeah. North of Casablanca, Africa, a Rabat, north of Rabat. And as you guys got closer to the city, what happened? Well, right at Fidela, or, or Rabat, there wasn't much happening until we got closer to C Casablanca, which is not too many miles. And then that's where we started getting uh, shore fire from the German battleships and their cruisers. That they, there was no rifle fire, as far as I know. Well, what kind of fire were you taking on? Art, artillery from the German battleships and, the, and their, their destroyers. Could you see the battleships? Yes. What is I, 
the, the, I saw the, uh, the USS Mar uh, uh, Marine battleships shelling the shore, and they sunk the two German battleships. As far as much rifle fire, there wasn't much rifle fire. It was mostly just, just sh uh, shell fire. I explain something to me. The naval shelling that you took on, were those rounds from American ships that were short, or were those German shells? The German, sh German ships were shelling us on the shore, and the uh, U.S. battleship Missouri was shelling the sh German ships and sunk them. I see. As far as I know, they sunk both of them. But could you see the German ships shelling? Yeah, yes, I sure did, and I could see the, the shell from the... Uh, American battleship too, because that's a twelve. I think a twelve-inch shell. I could see it going from where I was. What did you guys do when you started to take on the German naval shelling? Well, we just tried to hide. We we couldn't do any. We couldn't do anything to their battleships, so we just kind of kept hid. And I dug a foxhole when necessary. Do you remember, were there any casualties from the German naval shelling? Well, yeah, there must have been, but I have no idea how many. Do you have any experiences fighting the Vichy French? People from France, they, they wanted us. They didn't want to fight. They didn't want to fight the Americans. But the Germans made him, as far as I could tell. So then, ha, explain to me what happens after the shelling from the naval, the German ships, after they were shelling you. Well, after the, after the, uh, the U.S. sunk all the German ships or they took off, then we just settled down and uh, uh, kind of got our people together, dug a foxhole and stayed there for a while. How long would you say the German naval shelling lasted? Oh, it lasted most of a day, most of a day. And were they accurate where they were shelling? Well, they just shelled the hill, shelled the hillside and... And how close did the shelling get to you? Oh, probably 150 yards. And what does it sound like when these shells are... <laughs> I don't know. It just blew up a bunch of dirt. It never, never hit me anyhow. So from there, where do you go? We went to Rabat, Africa, and Casablanca. We didn't have much... Uh, much resistance from the army. It was mostly just from the German Navy and French Navy. And then what? Well, then we kind of settled down a little bit. We got into we got into Casablanca and uh, we got to we thought we were going to stay at a school overnight. We were in there 20 minutes, the only time I had a roof over my head in two years. And they said that we had to go down on the shore because there was some, still some enemy down on the shores at Casablanca. And then we stayed down, we, we stayed in pup tents in Casablanca overnight. Well, there wasn't much. There wasn't much uh, uh, enemy shore fire. It was all, all mostly naval fire. Oh, we, they thought there was some more German enemy down there that we had to capture. Were there? Well, I guess there was, but not much. So then, where did you guys go from there? Well, we 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 regrouped and then. Stayed in our pup tents overnight, and I, I guess we went up towards uh, Rabat, Africa, the next day, and uh, pitched tents in a in a oak in a cork forest, and that's where we stayed for several days.
and take me through where do you guys go from there? Well, from Rabat, Africa, well, we got in our convoy and headed toward Tunisia to help fight Roma. And what do you remember about the fighting in Tunisia? Well, we didn't have, time we got to, to Tunisia, the war was over. The British had captured Rommel. So we did not see any action in uh, Tunisia. When you were in North Africa, can you talk to me uh, about if you had any experiences against the German Luftwaffe? Did the German planes ever strafe you guys? No, not that I recall. Not in, not in Africa. So, besides the invasion of North Africa, did you guys fight the Germans in any other way? No, we never had, we never done any fighting in Africa uh, except in uh, around uh, Casablanca. So, what do you remember about the landscape in Tunisia? Oh, it, it was desert mostly, and uh, dry. We had water, drinking water problems. Was a, water was scarce. We, uh, on our way, we, we was out of water. So a lot of the homes had cisterns where they caught the rainwaters. So we'd tie our belts together and untie it to our helmet and, and dip water out of the cisterns in the, at the ranchers' places and get water to drink. We'd, we'd have to strain the uh, mosquito larva out of our, through a handkerchief into our helmet to, and put adamant tablets in it to drink it. So water was a scarce item in Africa. Talk to me about the preparation that you all made for the invasion of Sicily? Oh, we done just some uh, marching. But about all we did in Africa is just some marching and getting our group together and, and discussing our form of attack. That's about it. You, know. you were under the command. Oh. You were under the command of General Trescott. Yes, and General Patton. What do you remember about General Trescott? Well, I don't remember a whole lot except he make us walk five miles an hour. Tell me about the Trescott trot. What was that? <laughs> that was a five mile walk. And I had to talk about that. Before we were getting on the ship to land in Sicily, uh, we, uh, we, uh, we walked 20 miles in five hours to get to the boat. And my General Patton, he, he yelled at me and he said, damn it, Sergeant, let me hear you get some orders. These men look like they're all pooped out. And I had a notion to tell him, sir, these men are pooped out. We just ran 20 miles and you rode in that damn Jeep. But I didn't tell him or I'd have been a private. <laughs> <laughs> Why was it so important for Trescott for you guys to be able to march that fast? To surprise the enemy, because we'd get, we'd get there quicker than they thought we would. And that's what happened in Sicily. Talk to me about the invasion of Sicily. Well, that was a pretty near disaster for us. Uh, we, we got on LCI number one, which is a, a landing ship with a flat bottom. It rode like a, bush, a wash tub in the water across the Mediterranean to the southern Africa. And when we got to the shore, the Germans shelled the ship or, and they, they couldn't let the the ramps down for us to land on shores. 
So he turned the boat around and, and told us to jump in the water and uh, wade ashore under machine gun fire and artillery fire. So we jumped in the water and he turned the boat around and washed us ashore with a propeller. And we finally captured the Germans or, or they retreated. But, uh, the only problem there is, it, it bothers me that the Navy got a citation for the invasion and, uh, and us Army people that don't, don't face soldiers got nothing for facing the, our, the machine gun fire. What did you see going on as you were under the machine gun and artillery fire? Well, we just tried to get our feet on shore and, and, and get rid of the enemy as we could. It didn't last very long. Well, we, we were all kind of waiting in to get into shore. Some got wounded. I, I didn't, but some of my men did. I didn't see very many men get wounded because I was too busy trying to get to shore. Well, I didn't I didn't get to shoot very much, but uh, just a few, because the Germans either got killed or uh, withdrew, Re retreated. Take me through your experiences on Sicily. After the invasion, what happened? Well, we, there was no hardly any resistance after we landed there for for a few hours there, uh, so we got grouped together and headed for Palermo, Sicily, which is in the north shore of Sicily. So we got together and we walked for three days and three nights, straight, steady, without any water with about anything to eat or, or sleep. My men were falling asleep walking. So, but we didn't have any resistance, although hardly any resistance across Africa to, Pala to Palermo, Sicily. But since we were short of water, I found a, uh, some water in a, in a cow's footprint. I dipped the water out of the footprint put it in my helmet, or strained it through my handkerchief in the helmet, put adamant tri tablets in it, and, and my men had a mouthful of water out of that cattle footprint, water. What did it taste like? What did I what? What did the water taste like? I have no idea, it was good. <laughs> it was wet, <laughs> that was the main thing. And that's all the water we had all the way across Sicily. What did the area where you were dropped off, what did it look like? Was it a sandy beach? No, it wasn't a sandy beach. It was, I don't really remember, kind of dirt, dirt beach, rock beach. I don't remember, but there was some timber brush. And where were the German emplacements? Were they pillboxes or machine gun nests? The machine guns were up on a ridge. I, I, I never did see the machine guns. All I saw was the bullets fly by. How close did they get to you? <laughs> Too dang close. <laughs> I never got hit. What is it like to have bullets going off around you? It scares the daylights out of you. That's all I can say. You hope they don't get, get you. Did you have any experiences fighting against the Italians? Well, uh, uh, the Italians really didn't want to fight the Americans. So they surrendered pretty quickly, if they had a chance. <clears throat> Are you recording? Yeah. Just, just me. <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> well, what are you recording? I'm not saying anything. You're saying something right now. <laughs> yeah, I'm saying something right now. Probably not good. You're doing great. Well, we got on our our convoy trucks to go to Tunisia, and we stopped for our regular call, and and uh, the as we stopped the. 
the bank gave away and the truck upset and I fell over backwards and hit my head on a rock and uh, my hip and it paralyzed my leg for about five, six days. But had I not had my helmet on, I would have been killed. That's, that helmet saved my life. Why did the truck stop? We, we had to do our usual, you want me to tell you? Our usual piss call. <laughs> they, they'd stop every so often for a rest. Did you smoke back then? No, I didn't smoke, no. I never took a puff of cigarette smoke in my life. Really? Really. I, and not only that, I've never drank a mouthful of beer in my life. Me too. Me too? Well, that's good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I don't drink and I don't smoke. I, t I tasted it one time when, when I was a teenager. Didn't like it. I spit it out and never tasted it since. You've never had any other alcohol? Oh, I have a highball once in a great while, but that's about it. <laughs> but it was unusual back then not to smoke. Everyone smoked back then. No, I didn't. What did you do with all your cigarettes? I, I, give, them, uh, I give them to those that did. <clears throat> now, you said your, your leg was paralyzed. But if you hit your head, how was your leg paralyzed? Uh, I hit on a rock on my hip, on that nerve in my hip. And, uh, and apparently, and I don't know uh, I, what they done about it, I don't remember. Did they send you to a hospital? No, no. But how? I really don't know what happened from then. I guess I hit my head too hard. Oh, I'm sorry. Did I do it? Did I mess it up? <laughs> okay. I think I think I went on I think I went on with the convoy with my crippled leg. Was it actually paralyzed? Well, it was numb, so I couldn't hardly use it. Well, we got, uh, when we were in Pearl Aramore in western uh, Sicily, uh, the Germans were still in the eastern uh, uh, Sicily, and me and my prune got in two rubber rafts, and we landed behind the German lines at night in those two rubber rafts, and uh, the Germans retreated, and, and I think that, I think that was the last of the fighting in uh, in Sicily, and that's where I got the shrapnel in my chest. What happened? My man stepped, one of my men stepped on a landmine, blew his leg off, and I got a piece of shrapnel in my chest. Well, it never went into my chest, it just uh, went into my rib. I took it out, never even took, went to the medics about it. You pulled it out yourself? Yes. It wasn't in very tight. It was about three, three inches or three or four inches long. But I didn't even go to the medics with it. When you made the amphibious night invasion, did you guys actually find the Germans and did you guys fight? No, there wasn't much fighting at all. They just ret retreated. I don't remember of even having to shoot a, anything there. And, and they all, then they surrendered and that was the last fighting in Sicily. How many times did you guys make these amphibious invasions? How many times? Well, I made three in, uh, three in Sicily, one in Africa, and then we, then we went on into Italy <coughs> after re regrouping in West, West Sicily. But I'm saying you made the initial invasion of Sicily. Yes. And then as you guys got towards P Palermo, you guys made two amphibious invasions? Yeah, in a, in a rubber raft. Well, 
We went in these rubber, my platoon went in these rubber rafts to shore. Was it in the daytime or night? No, it was dark. And how far did you guys travel in the rubber rafts? Oh, shoot. I, I don't know how far it was. It was, it was quite a little ways in rough water. The purpose of those uh, night invasions? Well, you'll have to ask them because I don't know what it was for. Chase the Germans out of Sicily, I guess. <laughs> it was just your platoon? As far as I know, it was just my platoon, two, two rubber rafts. I was in the second platoon of F Company of the 7th Infantry. Where do you go from Sicily? Well, we went from, uh, I think it was Salerno, and went on went on north in it in Italy what do you remember about the invasion of Salerno there was no as far as I knew there was no no enemy fire Well, we were hiking up uh, on, on a highway in, in southern Italy. We came up on a waterfall. <laughs> all, of our, all of my men and I took off our clothes and took a shower. The only shower we had in two years. So maybe, maybe we scared the Germans from the way we smelled. <laughs> Tell me about your experiences fighting up the mountains in Italy. Well, we were, <laughs> we were going on and we come to the Volturno River, and we they were the engineers were supposed to build us a. a, a pontoon bridge across the river, but they couldn't because of the enemy fire. So we had to wade across the river in, sh in shoulder deep water with under machine gun fire, which killed a lot of the men. And that's where I got a, helm a bullet through my helmet right over my ear. It didn't hit my ear. They finally got across the river and I believe it's Mount Casino we tried to take. I think that's what it is. And we we had we had a lot of fighting going on, go, trying to capture Mount Casino. Uh, if I recall, I may be wrong on the mountain. You're right. You're right. Tell me about your experience crossing the Volturno River. How wide was it? How wide was the what? Volturno River. It probably was a, maybe 100 feet, but where I went across, it was probably just shoulder deep. And was it a swift river? Not really too swift, because we had a wave, we waded and uh, we made it across, except the machine gun fire was terrific. I could see the trader, it was dark. I could see the trader tracer bullets go past my head and one went through my helmet right over my ear never touched me luck again i guess but i could see the tracer bullets go by uh, you eventually made it across i made it across and i don't recall how many of my men made it across so after the Volturno River, you go on to fight near Monte Cassino. Well, after that, we, uh, we I guess we regrouped and, uh, and, and getting ready for the Anzio invasion. Why was the invasion of Anzio necessary? Well, nobody really knows. They had a quite a argument over that, but there was. As, uh, there was no resistance where I landed in Anzio. It wasn't until the third days that we had got into trouble. 
I was almost to where I could see Rome the third day, but then we had a withdraw. Well, we ran out of me. We ran out of men and and material. So and the Germans had had uh, set up a firing line. So we just had to stop and regroup. And there we stayed for about four or five months, I guess, on Anzio. And what do you remember about the fighting on Anzio? Well, we, we just had to go out on patrols every night to see where the enemy was and lived there for all those weeks, months, un, under artillery fire and the Germans tried to attack every so often. What was the closest you got to a German soldier in a firefight? Oh, uh, well, if, if it's a tank, it's about as far from me to my front door. <laughs> ten, ten, 10 feet, as far as the regular foot soldiers, uh, there's several yards. So away, wow. that, except for the tank personnel. Tell me about that story. Where were you? What happened? I was in my foxhole that I'd been living in for several weeks, several days. I had it dug pretty deep, and a, a tank came, came through the line and was within 10 feet of my foxhole shooting the machine guns into my foxhole right over top of me. They couldn't hit me, but they shot up all my sea rations I had set on a shelf in the foxhole. Darn guys anyway, they spoiled my dinner. But they couldn't hit me because they couldn't shoot low enough. And they, my, the artillery finally got on the tank and the tank withdrew. And I, I crawled out of my foxhole with my empty sea rations. <laughs> oh, well, uh, th this uh, German tank went through our, our troops, I uh, went through our line, and went past me and, and my men, and I found a, uh, I finally got a hold of a bazooka, which is a, a rocket firing army uh, tank uh, grenade. I, I picked it up and fired a bazooka into the into the tank and it hit right below the turret and put the tank out of commission as far as they could turn the turret, so they withdrew. What happened to the crew? Oh, we, we regrouped and, and went on. I, I, I don't remember what happened. But the German tank, were they firing at your men? They were fire. They were firing at the men ahead of me. Yes, but I don't know whether they're shooting it hit anybody. <laughs> we didn't have living condition, did we? <laughs> when we stopped, we lived in the ground. Tell me about what is that like? Well, the first thing you do when you stopped, you dug a foxhole, which is where you lived. Uh, and depending on how long you were going to be there, it depends on how good a foxhole you had. I had a pretty deep one when that tank tried to shoot me. What is it like living in a hole in the ground? Well, it wasn't very pleasant. You were cold. You were wet. You slept with your helmet on. I did, anyhow. Well, one time, I was, uh, one of my men and I dug a foxhole for both of us, and we, we, we were there in that same foxhole long enough to put a roof, kind of a shelter over the top, and one, one day a shell hit on top of, the, of our foxhole and blew the top off, and uh, my uh, squad leader in there with me he didn't have his helmet on, and he said, he said to me, he said, oh, they got me, they got me. And I said, where did they get you? 
uh, here on top of my head. I looked at his head and I said, oh, Sergeant, that's, that's just dirt. There doesn't hurt you. So he, he didn't get killed anyway. I just, I, I slept with my helmet on all the time. What is that like? That must be pretty uncomfortable. Well, it made a pillow with that liner kind of cushioned the head. When you were overseas in combat, how would you clean yourself? How did I do what? How did you clean yourself? We didn't. <laughs> well, like I said, we only had one shower in two years. Uh, whenever we did, we had our helmet, which was our wash basin. And if we could get water, we, we, we may be shaved, maybe, but I don't know if I shaved once or twice in the war. I don't, I don't remember how I shaved. Did you have a beard a lot of the time? <laughs> Not, I didn't have much of a beard, no. I, I, some way I got it shaved off and I don't know how. The bathroom was our helmet a lot of times, or we'd we'd go off in some ditch or something. One one time, me, me and my squad leader, we stayed close together, and he had to go to the pot, so we were kind of on a hill in a little cre uh, crevice. We usually went across that into a shell hole to do our job. And sometime or another in the night, the Germans had moved a machine gun over within range. And when he was over there doing his thing with his pants down, the machine gun saw him and they fired over top of him and he couldn't get his pants back up. They, he finally managed. And I, and I was across watching him trying to get his pants up with that machine gun firing. <laughs> And he told me later, he said, Yawn, you were laughing at me. <laughs> I said, it was kind of funny. But he finally got his pants on and got back up to where I was. <laughs> so, um, talk to me about your experiences under German artillery shells at Anzio. Well, that was one of our worst enemies, was the artillery fire. It scared you to death, because you never know when you were going to get hit. So uh, that that was one of one of our worst things was afraid of celery, uh, uh, shells exploding. My my accompanying commander and I was sitting on the edge of our foxhole. Uh, uh, discussing our invasions of uh, our, our, our attack, and a shell exploded within a foot of my head. It killed him, and I, I just got my ear ruined in the, uh, in the war. But I never got a scratch, and he got a shrapnel through his neck, and that ended him. So he was killed right next to you? He what? He was killed right next to you. He well, right, sitting right next to me. Yeah, the shell exploded right here. Because you guys didn't go all the way to Rome, they pulled you back. Yes. And then what happened? Well, we regrouped and uh, just settled down to stay there for a long time. And? The Germans were on the high ground, and we were on the low ground. And. So if the Germans had the high ground, what kind of things would they do to you guys? Well, they would see where we were and, and machine gun us, or try to, and and get artillery fire on us. Same way with any type of war. Oh, yeah, we, every night we had to go, to go out on patrol to try to check on the enemy. And uh, one patrol... Me and two other of my men went on a patrol, and we come around a bunch of brushes, and here was a German asleep in a chair by a house, with his rifle in between his legs. We could have killed him right there, 
but I, I did not have nerve enough to shoot him there while he was asleep. So you let him go? We, we retreated and told the enemy, what, or told them, oh, the headquarters, what we saw. There was a tank right alongside of the house. No, we never got in contact with any fighting on patrol, not, not me anyhow. Well, we were going to make this attack, and uh, uh, and walking, he, one of my men was right side to me, and he stepped on a mine and blew his foot off. Other than that, I didn't get any mine, land mines. So, but so that happened two times to you. One yes, in Sicily. One in Italy. I captured a bunch of Germans, but they were done fighting. Tell me about how did you capture them? Well, they they were in a uh, down in a in a dugout or hole or something, some kind of place they came out of, and they all came out and surrendered. So they were they didn't do any shooting. Talk to me about your experiences against German snipers. German snipers? Uh, I suppose the one that shot, shot from up on the hill and that bullet grazed my stomach was a sniper. <laughs> what happened? Well, uh, the bullet went across my stomach and my arm and I saw where he was shooting from and, and he, he didn't show up anymore. So maybe I got him. I don't know. Either that or I scared him to death. What do you remember about the breakout of Anzio? The breakout? Well, I'll tell you what. My, my, we, were, we were just getting starting to break out from our defense line. And <clears throat> I ran out of ammunition. But I saw a tank alongside of a house. And so I ran to that tank. I had uh, I had ran out of ammunition, so I ran to the tank and climbed on top of the tank and fired the machine gun in the, into the house through the windows and the door. And they threw a hand grenade out the window and it hit my pack and blew my pack off. But it didn't hurt me, although I smelled blood. But I, I yes, you can smell blood. I I couldn't uh, find any blood on me. So eventually, the Germans surrendered and uh, and let my men advance. So you jumped on a tank, an American tank. American tank that had struck a mine and the. The tank men took off, but, uh, but I climbed up on top of the tank and fired the machine gun into the house. And who was in the house? Who was in the house? A German enemy. They're shooting from the door and the windows. <laughs> I have no idea how many was in there. I fired through the windows from this machine gun on top of the tank. They, they really weren't firing at me. They were firing at my men. And where did the hand grenade land to you? Close to how close did the hand grenade land to you? How come? How close? What? Did the hand grenade land to you? The hand grenade hit my pack, blew my pack off. And what did the German hand grenade look like? They, they were like we called them potato mashers, because they were had a kind of handle on them like a potato masher. And that's what hit, hit my pack. And when they, when they contact, they explode. Well, all, all I know is I got a letter that, that my company can, commander, Captain Pierman, wrote to my mother, stating that I had been put in for the Silver Star. But to this day, I have not received the Silver Star they claim my records burn up in the St. Louis fire.
Do you still have the letter? Yes, I do. I never knew anything about it until I got home and my mother showed me the letter. I, I had no idea why, in particular, why I was put in for the Silver Star. The only thing I have is a letter to my mother that they claim my records burn up in the fire. So... Well, Joe Altus was my platoon leader, and on the way to Rome, they started shelling our convoy on the highway, and a shell hit him in his back and blew out three of his ribs. And uh, I, he, hit, he hit the barrel pit and I was right above him, and I never got a scratch. But he, he survived all right. I went to see him in California after he, I got back home, so it, it didn't kill him, but it broke three or four of his ribs. And what did he say to you? He, he said, uh, he, he said, Harold, I guess you'll have to take over. So he handed me his papers, and I took over on the way to Rome as, as company commander, uh, as platoon leader, I mean. Yes, I made it to Rome. I followed the big generals and the commanders into Rome. Us fighting soldiers, we got to follow the big shots into Rome. So they got the credit, I guess. <laughs> Patton and Truscott, I guess, went into Rome. I think that's the two. No, I went, we went into Rome and kind of regrouped a little. We kind of regrouped a little bit and, and uh, I put my men out on uh, patrol duty at uh, government buildings, and I I dug a foxhole on the south side of the Colosseum in Rome. That's where I lived for a few days. What was that like as a farm boy in Nebraska growing up to see the Colosseum? <laughs> well, I don't know. I went over there in 1975 to see if I could find my foxhole but it had grown up in weeds. But what was it like to see the Colosseum? What was it like to see the Colosseum? Oh, I guess it's all right. I didn't pay much attention to it. Now, when you were fighting in Anzio, when you were fighting in Anzio, yeah. do you remember, um, how often would the Germans show you guys? About every night. And how bad would it get? No, no. Oh, they never, they never got close to me. They were more shelling our headquarters. When you were in Anzio, yeah, didn't you spend most of your time underground? I spent all my, practically all my time in the ground to keep from getting killed because of artillery and machine gun and eye rifle fire and. Sometimes aircraft uh, fire. Every time we stopped for any length of time, we dug a foxhole. But, I mean, when you guys were at Anzio, you spent most of the day in your foxhole, right? Because the Germans could see you if you... That's right. So what would you do to pass the time when you were in the foxhole? Well, we tried to sleep, <laughs> tried to sleep, and I just stay in there doing nothing, nothing to do. And tell me about the fighting that you guys would do at night. Well, at at night, well, we didn't do too much fighting at night, we because you couldn't see anyway. But we just went out and uh, checking where the Germans were where the enemy was, whether Germans or Italian or French. So there wasn't much to do at night but lay there in your foxhole and shiver. <laughs> so 
I, a lot of the men that were killed, I never even knew them because I never had them long enough to know who they were. Is it true that replacements were often the first ones killed? The replacements, I got 21 replacements one night and ended up with eight next morning. What happened? The, we, we got these replacements and uh, I, I had them scatter out. It was dark, had them scatter out on the side of this hill. I had my foxhole dug below the hill and the Germans shelled us and, wo and wounded all but eight of the new recruits. And uh, the, the, the wounded ones kept hollering, Sergeant Nelson, Sergeant Nelson, and I am hurt. Well, I couldn't help them. I, otherwise, I'd have got killed. That's too bad. Oh, they, recruits that had never saw a combat day in their life, and, and they never, and then they got wounded or killed. I was, I was in this foxhole. I'd been there for weeks and weeks, and the Germans made their, their supposedly final attack, and they came down on a side of a hill across from me. Uh, they were coming by the dozens uh, to drive us off of Anzio. It, I, it was their last final attack on our on the Anzio beachhead. And I, my medics was watching me from his foxhole, and he was keeping track of how many enemy I shot, and his last count was 21. And that, finally they saw where I was shooting, and I got the bullet in, across my stomach and my arm. Well, they, they, we finally captured or killed the enemy. They finally gave up. Well, they didn't know where I was shooting from until the one guy saw where I was shooting from. Uh, they never shot at me until that one guy did. I just aimed at them, their whole body. I was 300 yards away or four, for maybe 500 yards at times uh, until the guy saw where I was shooting from. Then I kind of hid. Well, I fired one shot and he disappeared. <laughs> so I don't know. And they, they find not later, a little later on, they all surrendered. And that was the ending of the firing in Anzio. How long did this episode last from the moment that they came down the hill to when? Oh, 20 minutes. Not very long. Not very long, they came down in droves. Mr. Nelson, when you fired at those Germans, what did it look like when they were coming down the hill? It looked like a bunch of sheep. <laughs> A whole bunch of men coming down. That's about it, I guess. You know, it bothered, it bothered me then, and it bothers me to this day that I had to kill that many humans. They were no different than our army. They were, they were real people. And to have to just come and kill them is, is terrible, it's terrible. And I dream about it quite often. It's bad. It, it's still, I still hate to have to do that. But don't you realize by shooting them, you saved a lot more Americans? Well, I can't, I can't say much about it. I suppose I did, I don't know. If it wasn't for people like you, I wouldn't be alive today. No, oh, maybe. <clears throat> but anyway, my, my mother was born in Berlin and she had relatives in Berlin. And maybe I shot some of my own relatives, my, some of their, my mother's grandkids or something. It's a oh, Sisterna? Oh, well, me and, 
me and my company, our platoon, was the first ones in the cisterna. And they, we didn't have a whole lot of fighting. Uh, we, they, they, the, people, the enemy surrendered pretty quick. So we had a we we had a kind of a party when we got into Cisterna. There the, there wasn't any alcohol or, or wine in there anymore because I guess the Germans drank it all. But they surrendered, and that was the last of my fighting in the war. Explain to me, uh, after the fighting in Cisterna. Where did you go? We we re, we re, regrouped and uh, went towards Rome. When we were stationed in Rome, getting uh, ready to invade France, uh, we we were getting ready to load on our uh, uh, invasion ship in Rome, and my company clerk came a running to me. And as I was getting ready to board the ship, he says, Sir, Harold, you don't need to go. You're going home on rotation furlough. What does that mean? That, that means that was the best words I ever heard. You don't have to go. You're going home on rotation. So I went home. I did not have to in, uh, go on an invasion of southern France. You had enough points to go? Uh, oh, oh, yeah, I had the most points of any of them, so I was the first one to go home on rotation furlough. I don't know how they arrived at points, but I suppose it's your combat duty. Here, it says, can you hear me? Yeah. Sergeant Harold A. Nelson, Waterback, Nebraska, was what, you, wonder who that is. Was using his Tommy gun and grenades effectively on German troops in close combat recently when he ran out of ammunition. He spotted an abandoned American tank nearby, separated from him by an open space of 30 feet. He dashed across the opening, climbed in the tank, and turned its machine guns on the Germans. Quote, they were eliminated. The only thing is I climbed on top of the tank and not in the tank. They got that wrong. And then it has you quoted saying, I would have fired the big gun on the tank, Nelson said, but I didn't know how to shoot the blame thing. They, they got that wrong. I didn't climb into the tank. I got on top of the tank. But it says that you were using a Tommy gun and you were throwing grenades at the Germans before you went to the tank. Do you remember any of that? No, no, I was shooting. I shot up all my ammunition. Uh, so I climbed up. All, the tank was only about five, six feet from the house. And the Germans were in the house. The Germans were in the house. So before you got on the tank, were you firing in the house with your own gun? No, no, I didn't fire. I fired at the ones running, the, the ones in the open. The I, I, I did not fire at any in the house when I was running towards the tank. So what were you firing at then? I was firing at the other Germans ahead. And what were they doing? They were firing back. But how close were they? <laughs> oh, long way, three, four, five, six hundred yards. Okay, so you ran, you ran out of ammunition, and that's what caused you to go to the tank. Yes. Before you ran out of ammunition, yes. what were you firing at? I was firing at the retreating Germans. Okay. And they were leaving the house, or where were they retreating from? Well, it was their front line. They had their men stationed out there. But you could see the ones who were retreating. I, should, I saw them running, yes. And then you fired in their area. Yes. And then 
I don't know what happened to anybody. It was so, uh, well, you're scared and you're running and you're, you really don't know what's going on. And so it says here that you were throwing grenades at them as well. Do you that are what? That you were throwing grenades at them as well. No, I didn't throw any grenades at them. So after you ran out of ammunition. I ran out of ammunition. It says you had to run like across 30 feet yeah. of open ground. Yes. What do you remember when you were running across? I was just running to, to, to try to see the tank and uh, just, just running scared to death. And you were getting shot at? Well, I suppose I was. <laughs> I don't know. They never hit me. <clears throat> then I got to the tank and climbed on top of it. And the Germans were in the house. The Germans were in the house. And so you just took the top machine gun? I shot it in the windows in the door. Well, what possessed you to do all that? Keep from getting killed. And where were your men? Where were your men? The men were ahead of me. Kind of off to the side, scattered all over. Kind of scattered out. Uh, there so many things went on, I don't recall what, what in the heck all happened. All I know is I didn't want to get killed. <laughs> when you came home, what was it like being back home when the war was still going on? Well, you know, I was so sick, what, I didn't... What, what happened? Uh, I I got got off the ship and went and, uh, headed for home. How did you get sick? I just got uh, a throat infection over in Rome, and I got really really bad on the ship because they had no treatment. They they didn't have any any antibiotics on the ship. They left it all on the uh, on the land. And they, so I went on to Fort uh, <laughs> Golden. So when you came home, you went straight to Nebraska. Yeah, I went. Oh I, I, no, I went to uh, Fort Logan. I went to Fort Logan. You ought to get treated because I was so sick. And then what? Well, they gave me ten shots of penicillin, and I got over. My, my flu, and then I think I went to Arkansas from there, I think. I can't remember for sure. Did you have difficulty readjusting to civilian life after the war? Not that I know of, well, except to have war nightmares. Did loud noises bother you? The what? Loud noises. No. Oh well, it, for for several for several years, an explosion bothered. Fourth of July celebration bothered me with all them firecrackers. But I got over it. What life advice do you want to give to future generations? Well, for future generations, clean a leave clean, keep a clean life, enjoy your, everybody, and and just treat everybody with respect. If you were to give me some advice for my life, yeah. You know, I'm 20 years old, and you're 103. Yeah. When when I was born, you were 83. If you were to give me some advice for my life, what would you tell me? Well, lead a clean life. Uh, take take good care of yourself, 
and and work hard for work hard the rest of your life as you are able and respect everybody around you what would you want to say what would you want to say to all the men who were killed what would you want to say to all the men who were killed during World War II, fighting oh, overseas? Yeah. The guys who you knew, what would you want them to know? Oh, God bless all of them. I feel sorry for for them, and I feel sorry for all their their relatives. It's a sad, sad deal. Did you visit any of the families of the men who were killed? After the war, I don't, uh, I don't remember visiting the families, but I, re I visited the the eight of us that returned. What do you mean? As far as I know, there were there were eight of us returned from a company of two hundred, I think, a little over two hundred of the original men. And what were their other roles? You were a staff sergeant. What were their roles? Well, one was a cook, one was a supply sergeant, one was a medic, and uh, and the uh, rest of them were uh, uh, either squad leaders or uh, I, I or platoon leaders. I don't know how they. I don't know what they ended up as. In all of your years of living, what do you believe the purpose of the meaning of life is? The 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 purpose, I guess, of life is just keep on living and uh, and uh, res respect everybody and live a clean life. Whatever that is. Don't smoke, drink, or chew, or associate with those who do. <laughs> Going back to Sicily, what did Palermo look like? Was it destroyed? Palermo, no, Palermo wasn't destroyed at all. No, Bob Hope, Bob Hope was there giving his speech. You remember Bob Hope? you before your time. Well, I know who he but, is. But he's a comedian. Anyway, the Germans started shelling Palermo when he was trying to give his comments. And he said, that, dang, a guy can get hurt around here, can't he? <laughs> was he a funny comedian? Yeah, he was. He was interesting. He, he was funny. The shell started dropping close by, and he says, a guy can get hurt around here, can't you? He was on the stage in Palermo. We got to go to some kind of his doings. After the war, after the fighting in Sicily. <clears throat> Did you write letters home? Did you write letters home? Once in a great while, I never had anything to write on or write with. What would you write about? Well, I think in that book there is a letter to my lady, my woman I married about war. Other than that, you know, we weren't allowed to write much of anything. We couldn't write anything about the war. It, we were, our writing was censored. So about all it was, yes, I'm okay. That's about the story. You didn't, you didn't write about stuff you'd like to write about because it would be censored. You, you mentioned when in your writing, when you crossed the Volturno River, yeah. the Germans were firing at you guys. Yeah. How did you guys cross it? Were you in a single file line or were you spread out? Oh, we were spread out uh, up, down the river, up the river, down the river. We weren't close together. Man, of course, my outfit and the other outfits were crossing the river too. 
And could you swim? Could I what? No, I didn't. I couldn't swim. I waded across shoulder deep water. Did you ever learn to swim? No. I took a few treatments in the service, but I never learned how to swim. Are you going to consider learning now? No way, Jose. <laughs> I have a knife trouble in the shower. <laughs> You're reading the history of my life there. Did you ever read uh, Bill Malden, the comics? Well, I got his book right here. I know, but I'm saying when you were overseas, did you ever read it or no? No, no, we never got anything. We never got anything in printing overseas. We're lucky to get our mail. Once in a great while. What kind of person do you want to be remembered as? What kind of what? What kind of person do you want to be remembered as? Well, I'd like to be remembered as a good father. And I guess that's about it, whatever a good father is. <laughs> I'd like to re have be remembered at some of the things I've done in my day. Oh, like, like the work I did at where I worked in my farming days, school days. But how well I treated them, and 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 what and the kind of life that I lived. I had a good life. I worked hard. Took care of my family. <laughs> You write that in Anzio, tell me about the difficulty of digging a foxhole because of the water. Well, a lot of places you, uh, when you hit water when you dug a foot deep, so you had a wet foxhole. And other places you had a, I had to use a pick to pick through the rocks to dig a foxhole. What do you remember about the German 88 shells versus the German mortar shells? That 88 shell was the worst wicked thing they had. It was a really a, a weapon. And they had a lot of artillery that... that uh, one one thing I think fired eight shells at a time, and then they had that big gun that, uh, but shell fired big shells. Did you have a, a rope you used when you crossed the Volturno River? Was there any rope that you held on to? When no, no way. We were supposed to go on a, a temporary bridge, but they couldn't build it. Too much machine gun fire. Well, I was in my foxhole, and, and that German was the same one that was shooting at my, my squad leader. And I see him stand up there. Uh, he, he was shooting at, at us, and I, sh I shot back at him, and he, and he 
put his helmet on his rifle and held it up in the air wanting me to shoot at him. But I, I never did get a shot at him. We were, we, were, we were discussing our plan of attack, and those three officers, two and me, uh, discussing it, and well, there was, I guess there were three officers, and they'd be saying something, and I'd say, I'd say yes, sir, and, and he says, how come you're saying yes, sir? You never said yes, sir, to me before. I says, I wasn't outnumbered until now. <laughs> now, when you ran to that abandoned tank, and but, you, go, you know how you got on top of the tank? Yeah. How far did you have to run to get to the tank? Oh, three, four hundred yards. I think, I, I don't know for sure. Two, three, four hundred yards. What did I say there? A couple hundred yards. A couple hundred yards. But but the newspaper article says 30 feet. 30 feet? So they're wrong. Well, more than 30 feet. It was, a, it was a couple hundred yards? Yeah. And it was open ground? Yes, it sure was. And were they firing at you as you were running? They Well, I don't know whether they were not. They were firing at my men. <clears throat> but I have no idea... They never, never, as far as I know, they never came close to me if they did fire. <clears throat> when the bullet hit the back of my helmet, I do not know when that happened. I never heard it. So what did you do when you, I mean... Did you still use the same helmet, or did you change? No, I got rid of it and got another one because there was plenty of dead soldiers' helmets laying around. You know, our helmet was our lifesaver. It was our water wash basin. Whenever we had water to wash with. Now, your two purple hearts, one it's because someone next to you stepped on a landmine and a piece of the shrapnel. Right. Yeah. And your other Purple Heart was from when you were shot. Right. Right. Shot across my stomach and my arm when the German, when I shot 21 Germans. I used an M1 until I ran out of ammunition and I picked up a German rifle and used it. The Germans didn't know where you were. No. Were you hiding, or they just... No, I was kind of, ha I was standing in my, or halfway sitting in my foxhole. I was, I wasn't standing up, I was, I think, sitting on the side of my foxhole. Were they running in your direction, or... No, they were running over here to the side, to the right of me. And so, would you try to lead them, if they were running? It's not like they were standing still. Beat the heck out of me. I was a pretty good rifleman. And, and how long of a period? 20 minutes? 20, I don't know, 20 minutes probably. <laughs> probably 20 minutes. Were you the only one firing? No, I guess my men were firing too, because I was here and there over there in a foxhole. We don't stay together. But eventually, what happened to you? What happened to what? Eventually, what happened to you? To me? So you fired at these 21 Germans, but then... Well, I kind of cut down my foxhole a little deeper. <laughs> they found out where I was. And then what happened when they found out where you were? Well, this guy up on the hill from where these men were going down, he was up on the hill up there. He saw me, and he's the one that shot at me because I followed the trash bullet track right up there to the top of the hill. And I, and I shot one shell and he disappeared. So I don't know whether I hit him or he got scared to death. Where did he hit you? Across my stomach and my arm. Just cut my outer skin. 
cut the outer skin of my stomach and my arm, doctored it up a little, and never even went to the medics. How'd you get your Purple Heart? Well, I was, somebody told them I was wounded. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Somebody, I suppose my company, my platoon leader said I got hit. And how did you figure out where he was? Because of the trajectory of the bullet going across my stomach and my arm. I looked right up, up that way. I looked right up that way and I seen him up there behind a uh, behind a concrete barrier. What could you see? I just saw his shoulders and his head. You can put your glasses on. Yeah. Yeah, put your glasses on. Uh, I'm looking at a letter from James Pier and Pierman, my company commander, and he wrote a letter to my mother, and here is the letter. Dear Mrs. Louise Nelson, as Staff Sergeant Harold A. Nelson, company commander, I wish to take this opportunity to, of writing you to let you know that splendid work he has been doing on the Angio Beachhead. Sergeant Nelson has always exhibited fine leadership and personal courage. He is liked and respected by his platoon and has the confidence of all men in the platoon. During these trying days, we need men of his caliber, and it is a pleasure to acknowledge the splendid work he has done. I know you will be glad to hear of his, of his excellent service. He has received a combat infantry badge for exemplary service in, in, in action, and his name has been submitted to regiment for the Silver Star Award for his gallant action in combat. He is well and in good health. Sincerely, James N. Perlman, Jr., Captain Infantry. That must mean a lot that your company commander. But I never, but I never got the silver star. But it's it's right there. It's right there. The company they, commander thought you. They lost my. They claimed my records burn up and. No, what what am I? What all am I supposed to read of this? Oh, uh, this is from my hometown paper. Wallback, Nebraska. Resourceful Sergeant. Sergeant Harold A. Nelson, Wallback, Nebraska, was using his Tommy gun and grenade effectively on German troops in close combat recently when he ran out of ammunition. Looking about for reinforcement, he spotted, spotted an abandoned American tank nearby, separated from him by a open space of uh, 30 feet. He dashed across the opening, climbed on the tank, and turned its machine guns on the Germans. They, they were eliminated. I would, I would have fired his big gun on, his, on the tank, he said, but I didn't know how to shoot the blame thing. The action took place while Nelson was fighting with the 3rd Division on the 5th Army Front in Italy. The article below is not the whole story. I was shooting the machine gun on the tank into the doors and windows of the house from less than 10 feet when they threw a, what we call a potato masher that hit my pack and exploded. It blew my pack up into pieces. I thought I smelled blood, but, but I guess it wasn't mine as I could not find any blood. However, my action allowed my men to advance. Subse subsequently, the Germans surrendered and, caught up, and I caught up with my men, uh, what was left. I'm Harold Nelson. I'm 103 years old. And this is one of my 
68 perpetual motion machine that still doesn't work. It goes like that. What's a perpetual motion machine? A, a perpetual motion machine is a, is a machine that runs on its own without any exterior power. So how, how would this one work? Explain, how is that supposed to work? Well, the, get these magnets turned around. Uh, what, let me know when you're ready. I'm ready. The, the, these magnets push against each other. And that pushes it out, that starts it. <laughs> you, you came up with this on your own? Ready. I'm ready. How many of these have you made? Oh, this is my 68th one. What happened to the other ones? They went in the junk pile. <laughs> do, so. you, do you think this is the one? That's <laughs> right, I get it around here. What makes this one special? What, what, is this the one? Well, these are magnets. These are magnets that oppose each other. Tell me, what were your other perpetual motion machine ideas? Tell me oh, about Oh, I've had a lot of magnetic ones. I've had ball bearing. I had ball bearing ones. I had weights. I have a lot of magnetic ones. And they almost work. Almost. But I can't quite get that almost done. So <laughs> I keep trying. It's something to do. So. What else do you do here? What else do you do? Here, I, I'll show you something over here. If, if, you don't turn it on yet. So, can you get over here? Yeah. I'm okay. Don't worry. Don't worry. You need to come over here. I want you to watch this here. What is it? That's done. <laughs> what is it? You created that? That's enough. Did you create that? Did I what? You made that? Yes. On your own? Well, sure. Wow. Ain't nobody makes anything here but me. Wow. Are you it? You're done? What else have you made? <laughs> what else have you made? Oh, I made a lot of things, but, uh, but they're most of them. Here's a piston engine. Here. You probably... This a... I don't know if you'll be able to... Just, just hold on just a minute. Dang it. Dang it, don't don't start yet. This is a piston engine without a crankshaft. See it go around here? A piston engine without a crankshaft.
Well, you don't need a crankshaft with this. See? See the piston? This is a piston. Uh-huh. It's up and down. See? And this is a crankshaft. This is a drive shaft. That's awesome. Okay. I see. You. I'll have to get a I'll have to get a wrench. Why? I got to get around. I got to get a wrench. A what? What are you gonna do? <laughs> what are you What are you about to do? What are you about to do? I'm going to show you an electric motor that doubles the horsepower. And you created it? Mr. Nelson! Did you make it? Yes. Wow. I'll have to put a glove. I'll have to put a glove on. Now, you better get over this, from over here. Dang. Oh, here. Unplug it, I'll plug it in over here. No, no, it's uh, Will it reach? Yeah. What, what are we looking yeah. at? What is this? This is a, this is a way, this is a way to double the horsepower of electric motor. So, okay. I'll turn it on. See? See, you can't stop it. It's running. Yeah. Okay. Now we're having a regular motor. Now come on, up in here. Here. Now, now it, it's doubling the horsepower. Oh, wait a minute. Never got it right here. Don't worry about it. Huh? It's not don't worry about it. Oh, okay. I got a chain. See? This here. Right away. Just a minute here. Oh, I got it. This is a piston engine without a crankshaft. It has no connecting rod. It has no wrist pins. Just the head of the piston. And you created it? So I can't afford to get a patent on it, so it sits here in my garage. You would like to get a patent? I would, li I would like to get a patent on it, but I can't afford it. And, and what was that? What about it? Oh. Th these are... These are windshield wiper blades to take the bugs off. It scratches the bugs off and then wipes the windows clean. How did you come up with that? How did you come up with that? Well, driving across Nebraska, I had to stop and wash my windshield every so often uh, because the regular wiper wouldn't take the bugs off. So I made this one to take the bugs off. Did you ever use it? Oh, yeah, a couple times. How did it work? Works wonderful. Takes the bugs off. 
<laughs> yeah. Mr. Nelson, what are we looking at? This is a replica of a helmet I wore in Italy crossing the Volturno River. A bullet hit, went through the side of me, side of my helmet just above my ear, uh, but it never touched my ear. On the back side is a bullet mark I got in Sicily. Uh, I don't know when it happened. I don't know. I didn't know it until I tried to put water in it and leaked. So I got me a different helmet from, from, that was laying on the ground. Put it on for me. I don't know how to wear it anymore. <laughs> the, these are some German prisoners we captured in Cisterna, Italy. Who is that? Uh, that? That is a picture of me checking the German prisoners. That's you? Uh, that's me right there. So we, we captured a lot of Germans in, uh, in Cisterna. Me and my company. What do you remember about Cisterna? What did it look like? Well, it was a torn... Cisterna was a mess. It was a torn up mess. The Germans ate, drank all the, the wine in the city. And tell me about the bicycles. Uh, some of my, some of there was a bunch of vacant bicycles there in town. So some of my men started riding bicycle when the firing stopped. <laughs> Was it a tough battle, Cisterna? It wasn't really too tough a battle. They kind of give up early. Are you in this? Uh, I guess that's, that's probably me. I captured uh, some more prisoners, me and my men, checking the prisoners over and sending them back to the rear echelon. Do you remember doing that? Do you remember that? Yeah, I, re I, I remember doing it, but not much about it. What kind of things would you check the Germans for? When you were searching the Germans? Searching the Germans? Yeah, what would you look for? Oh, uh, we're searching for their names and, and their weapons. And that's about it. We just we just had uh, Siegel S S Sergeant Siegel and I just got our mail and we were reading our mail. We didn't get mail very much. Once in a while we kind of looked for mail, but we didn't get much. Which one are you? The, that's that's Sergeant Siegel and me. Which one? I'm are to the I'm to the left and Siegel is to the right. We're, well, yeah, I picked up one souvenir of a Breda rifle from a, from a dead German, and I, I mailed it home, which I wasn't supposed to do. I put it in a container and put it in, in sand, and my officer checked it out. He said, I, I, I wrote on there uh, seashells, and my officer said, those are the heaviest sea shells I ever lifted, and he signed it anyway. <laughs> it's a picture of my platoon in uh, Anzio, Italy. What was left of my company? Uh, 20, 21 or 22 men. And not very many of them came back. This was before the war in Germany. Well, the lambs, were, uh, the lambs were running around there, not getting any food or anything. So uh, I, I shot this lamb and, and uh, I, I butchered it. I was the only one that knew how to butcher anything because I was an old Nebraska farmer. Uh, I cut it and, and carved the meeting out and went to the tank. The ha tank people had uh, lard for frying, so I, I fried the, the lamb in a, my mess kit. So my men had fresh meat for one day. 
Oh, another time there were, these cows been running around there, hadn't been milked for days and days. So I stopped one of them and got my helmet, and I milked three helmets full of milk out of that one cow. My men had milk for, for, to drink the first time, I think, and only time in the war. I think the, I think the cow was happy that she got milked. Nobody else knew how to milk a cow by hand but me. And <laughs> uh, late in the evening, we went around and, and picked up the dead soldiers, and the medics came and took them back to the rear echelon, and I suppose they went back to the States. Well, we, we just ransacked the dead Germans to see what they had and left them lay. The bodies were laying there so long that if you picked up an arm, it would almost pull out. So my men were kind of scared to do that. They were new men. I said, don't worry about the dead Germans. you got to worry about the live ones. <laughs> so that was the story of a dead German. I used an M1 rifle most of the war. I, I was only a th authorized to wear a pistol because of my being staff sergeant. But I used the M1 rifle because it worked every time. Thank you. Thank you for your time and thank you for your service. God bless you. Oh, thank you.